Wonder Tablet 4. This one, by itself, alone, exclusively, can close up nearly every mental hospital in the world by next Sunday night. Live your life one single day at a time. If you ever have an opportunity to visit a mental hospital, grab it. It's a marvelous education. But remember, won't you, that everybody inside was once outside. The reason they're inside is because they insist on piling on their poor, weak little backs all the accumulated yesterdays and all the frightening tomorrows. They keep piling it on their little backs until one day the poor, weak little back cracks. Now, this is the only day you can possibly live. Why do you turn it into a hell over what you did, what's going to happen? Well, they worry about the future. Maybe I'll fail. Maybe I won't make it. I wish you could see my students when I announce an exam for next month. They all fail on the spot. I always like to tell them the story of the medical student. The night before a big exam, he went out on a big drinking spree. When he came to take the exam, a little bleary, one of the questions was, give several reasons why mother's milk is superior to bottled milk. He wrote, one, it's fresher. Two, it's easier to take to the beach. Three, the cat can't get at it. And four, it comes in cute little containers. Wonder Tablet 5. There is a law in psychology that says if you will form a picture in your mind of what you would like to be like, if you will keep the picture there long enough, you will eventually become exactly as you picture. What did I just say? I said that if you fill your mind with sad thoughts, you think sad, you look sad, you feel sad, you are sad. You fill your mind with happy thoughts, you think happy, you sound happy, you look happy, you are happy. You can't be happier than you think you are. You can't be more confident than you think you are. You can't be younger than you think you are. One little Jewish lady came to see a doctor. She expected a man with a, an old man with a beard. Out comes a young, handsome, strapping doctor. He says, Mrs., go in the other room, please, and remove all your clothes. She said, knock it. He says, yes, naked. She says, doctor, you first. <laughs> You see, she thought young, she was young. <laughs> now, you will never be healthier than you think you are or more beautiful than you think you are. One woman had overslept. She heard the garbage truck going by outside. She jumped out of bed with her curlers, her mud pack. She grabbed the garbage can. yo -ho, garbage man, am I too late for the garbage? He said, no, jump right in. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, Please lend me your ears. I'm about to give you the bluebird's name. The bluebird's name is the foundation of all psychiatry. It is the cornerstone of all happiness. It is one of the briefest and most important words in the English language. The name of the bluebird is spelled Y-O-U. You are the bluebird. The bluebird is in here. It is in here. It's in the way you look at life. People say to you, are you worried, troubled? Go to Sorrento for a month, forget it. What they don't tell you is, all your troubles get right on the train with you, ride straight to Sorrento, no extra fare at all. Now, trouble isn't in Melbourne, in Brisbane, in Sydney. Trouble is in you. It goes where you go. It's in the way you look at life, the way you've been taught to look at life, the way you've learned to look at life. You see, we learn it. An Australian has a different outlook than an American or a Frenchman. A lady, for example, in New York City was taking a bath on her ground floor apartment. She tried to open the window, but it was stuck. Suddenly it flew up, and the force of it, she fell headfirst out the window, right into an ash can, with her legs dangling out. <laughs> At that moment, a Frenchman happened to walk by. When he saw her, he said, Oh, these extravagant Americans, she's good for ten more years yet. <laughs> Of course, it's the way you look at life. 
Whatever the problem is, the bluebird is you. Could you be like one Jewish lady who walked into a department store in Brooklyn, New York? She walked up to the floor, walked, and said, Mr. Where can I find, please, Johnson's baby pointer? <laughs> By coincidence, he was extremely bow-legged. He said, Madam, walk this way to count to three. You'll find it. He said, Mister, if I could walk that way, I wouldn't need Johnson's baby pointer. <laughs> Didn't you get the picture at all over here? <laughs> Wonder tablet six. I've saved for last. Because without it, no amount of millions will ever make you rich. The government can't tax you on it. A thief cannot come to your home and steal it. There's no place in the world you can go to buy it. It is life's most precious and cheapest luxury. I know of nothing that will help you to rub shoulders with happiness more consistently than your ability to laugh. Tell me how healthy is your sense of humor. <laughs> You've seen blood pressure machines that doctors apply to test a patient's health. One day a great genius will be born who will invent a laugh pressure machine. Oh, that will show much faster the state of your physical and mental health. Could you be like one man who received a bill from his doctor? The doctor had written at the bottom of the bill, this bill is one year old today. He sent it back with a note, happy birthday. <laughs> Have you ever observed how a little trifle, oh, a, a, a little thing, can sometimes change your entire destiny? You know, sometimes we think, if I hadn't gone out on this night, at this hour, I wouldn't have met him, I wouldn't have met her, how different my life would have been. Now, Melbourne, Australia, to New York City, USA, is a long way. But I know that I would not be on this stage tonight if it weren't for a tiny little sentence this big whispered into this ear not too many years ago. I'm a graduate of four universities. I hold four degrees. Now, I don't tell you this to brag, but simply to show you how many books and professors I've been through. <laughs> of them all, where do you think I learned the most wonderful lesson of my entire life? Not from a learned professor in an ivy-clad university, but from a little 15-year-old crippled girl. I tell it to you as it happened. When I graduated university for the first time, I took a position teaching in a New York City secondary school. I worked for my doctor's degree at the time. And the principal, the headmaster, put me in charge of the crippled boys and girls. In New York City, we have a system whereby if a boy or girl is severely crippled, a bus will pick him up at his home every morning, bring him to school, and then at three o'clock, the bus comes and takes him home again. This was my class. I wish that every one of you could have stood in front of my class any morning and watched my boys and girls coming in. Not really coming in. Pulling, tugging, pushing their sticks, their straps, their irons, twisting their deformed little bodies into the chairs. Oh, it was a sight. One day, because of a blizzard, the bus did not come at three o'clock. I put as many of the children as I could into my car, and I started to take them home. When we came to one girl's house, I opened the door for her, but because of her heavy brace, she fell headlong into the snow. At this, all the children in the car laughed out loud. I said, what are you all laughing at? This little 15-year-old sitting next to me with a brace up to here turned to me and whispered, You see, teacher, if we don't laugh, she'll cry. This is the lesson I never forgot.